a lot of interdisciplinary projects at the University of Illinois, and those are the most interesting to me. I think things that combine the biological sciences and the physical sciences or engineering uh, with other disciplines like the humanities and the arts, I think those are really, I don't want to say specific ones, but those are the kinds of projects that I find to be really interesting. And we have quite a few of those now uh, at the University of Illinois. It's really hard to say what is the greatest advance in our field in the last 10 years because there's been so many advances. It's hard to just say this one thing was it. Robotics is this multidisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary, there's just too many things going on at once. Uh, there are a lot of technologies, a lot of capabilities that we have today which 10 years ago I didn't think would be possible. You know, for example, being able to wander around uh, this hotel and have a mapping software, figure out where you are just from the images. You know, that, that, you know that, that's amazing. Uh, being able to build mechanisms that are very small, strong, modular, also very, very impressive. But I'm still also amazed as to how we can build robots to discover biology. So there are people building bat robots that will help discover what bats are doing. People are working on snake robots to help figuring out what snakes are doing. There are too many to name, but I'll name some. Um, a big advance is that machine learning people learned math. In the 1990s, I'm not sure they had learned math yet, and now they have very sophisticated mathematical tools that they use, and they solve real problems that weren't being solved before. Uh, and that way of thinking has gone outward into all sorts of computer science-oriented disciplines that used to have more the feel of ad hoc problem solving instead of mathematical rigor. Uh, and that, I think, has revolutionized the way pieces of the community look at problems, and the things that happen are much more sophisticated. Um, the advances on the hardware side from material science to mechanism design have changed the way we design and implement the devices. So you have new mathematical insights governing theoretical advances that we didn't anticipate and applying to mechanical systems that we didn't anticipate. Sensor technology has advanced incredibly, driven largely by consumer electronics like cell phones and these sorts of things. And so now you have sensing capabilities that you didn't anticipate. And all those things have happened, really come into the mainstream in the last decade or so. And it's really revolutionized what you see. And that's why you have an explosion uh, at a conference like this year's robotics conference. The number of good papers is a lot higher than 10 years ago. Yeah, that's true. I would like to be most remembered for my students. I want people to think Howie has great students. No old person wants to be remembered for his research. He wants to be remembered for the research that he aspires yet to do. Uh, and so I'm hoping I'll do something important enough that that's the thing uh, and that I haven't done it yet. That's my hope. I think there's such a broad area of topics in robotics, it's hard to pinpoint which one a young person should do. But in any of those topics, that person should be rigorous, especially mathematically, and then with a good experiment. Uh, we want people to have the math because you can assert guarantees, uh, uh, be able to prove something, learn something new, discover new truths. And the experiments are also important because you want to make sure it's grounded in reality. It's very easy to go off into some little tangent that has no bearing uh, in reality. Often you'll find that the good experiments will then drive the good theory, and the good theory will drive good experiments. I, I think the, there are two things young people need to do, and the first one is not be seduced by immediate reward for gizmos and gimmicks and demos that look cool and satisfy immediate demand uh, and to not be seduced by the dollars of the marketplace to do things based on interests that don't coincide with their own long-term intellectual curiosities. Uh, and the second challenge for young people is they have a lot of stuff they need to learn. Um, it's not like the old days where you could just learn mechanical engineering and that would be enough. You really have to learn a breadth of material now. Uh, and then it's for them to decide how to take that stuff and do interesting things.
So my advice for people who are in the K through 12 area, interested in science and engineering, is to, one, stop playing video games. Too much video games, maybe an hour a day is okay. Uh, but two, you know, pursue two, at least two hobbies. One that would be technical. You know, let's say they're interested in robotics, they should learn how to program, learn how to build mechanisms, make circuits, you know, something that pursues that, that, that technical interest. But they should also do something else. You know, play a sport, play, a, play an instrument, s volunteer in some charity. Just don't do all technical. Uh, you'll find that it'll give you perspective, each will give you perspective on the other, and it'll just make you overall a happier person. Um, the, the, the foundation of a top quality journal, it, it goes from the bottom to the top. It's, it starts with the reviewers, but you don't have good reviewers if you don't have good associate editors, and you don't have good associate editors if you don't have good editors. Uh, the, the foundations are to have really strong, rigorous people in, in the editorial board uh, paying close attention. And the second thing is to try so hard to ignore irrelevant things like impact factors and to focus on the quality of the work instead of on things uh, like financial incentives or uh, immediate kinds of, of numerical rewards that evaluate what you're doing. Uh, because uh, things like impact factors uh, measure the impact you had in the last two years. The most important papers have impact over 20 years and maybe the impact's not even known for the first five years. Uh, I think a lot of editors-in-chief are seduced by things like, I use the word seduced too much, editors-in-chief are seduced by things like chasing impact factors and lose track of really the need to do high quality fundamental research whose value might not be appreciated in the short term at all. Um, I, the change I would like is I would like my community to wake up one morning and everyone in the community would say, I wish I had some papers to review that I could review quickly and provide thorough, insightful comments. Uh, that's what I would like to change. I would like the community's feeling about the responsibility of doing reviews to change from it's a nuisance that I hate to it's a responsibility that I enjoy and embrace. My last international collaboration was with uh, a researcher in, Tur in Turkey. His name was Ulrich Sernali. He's great. He's from the Middle Eastern Technical University. Uh, he and I went into these burial mounds in Turkey uh, where, uh, where we sent our robots to go look for uh, evidence of or look for artifacts that were deep inside these areas that people otherwise could not have accessed. Um. I don't have very many formal collaborations. I have a lot of informal collaborations and interactions. Um, nothing funded, right? So it's, it's at an informal level. Uh, but I like that. The, the, the style of research in Europe is very different from the style of research in the United States. And so it's, it's really useful to me to collaborate with people that come from that background. They have a very different perspective on things. The difference between the States and Italy is the same as the difference between the States and France or Spain, and that difference is Europeans understand how to live life and Americans don't. Um, we work a lot, we have little concept of enjoying life outside of work, and Europeans start with how do I enjoy my life and arrive to how does my work fit into that picture. Um, and that's a broad stereotype, but I believe it's true. Well, there's different kinds of robots that I play with outside of work. So at work, there's snake robots, but when sometimes I'm home, I play with a quad rotor robot. Uh, after that, I like to ride my bike. I run. I, I, I read a lot of email.
Yeah. Um, I don't have any hobbies that I practice enough to really feel that they are hobbies. Uh, I like uh, I like music. I like to play music, but it's, it tends not to be so musical. So uh, I do it mostly in my basement alone. Um, and uh, whiskey. I like whiskey. And when you put those two things together, I spend a lot of time alone in my basement. But I'm always happy there. Nineteen ninety five. In nineteen ninety five, uh, in Nagoya, we were at a robotics conference, as we often are. And often at robotics conferences, you find yourself in a group of twenty people, looking for dinner. And you don't find dinner because you have twenty people who all have a different idea of what should be dinner. And if you all agree, the restaurant has not a table that seats twenty people. And at some moment, one of us—I don't ever remember who—said, "I would be happy just to have McDonald's." And the other one said, "Yes, let's do that." And that was our first trip to McDonald's, and we decided it should happen on a recurring basis. But not until 2001 did we start taking photos and putting them on the website. I think the first one was Beijing. Beijing, I mean, I mean so, but it speaks to how computing technology has changed yes. since we started this. Now computers are more interconnected. There's cheap cell phones with cameras on them. It, it really, it's changed the way we do our web page. It has. Yeah. So it revolutionized. Mm -hmm. uh, in many ways. I think the person that influenced my career the most is probably Jean-Claude Latombe. My advisor, Joel Burdick, influenced my career the most. There would be Howie, yeah. Uh, Seth? La Tranger by Albert Camus. Uh, there's two. One of them is uh, How to Fight Off Your Robot Army by Daniel Wilson. Mm -hmm. and the other one is uh, Robot Motion. Or Principles of Robot Motion? Yeah, that something like that. Yeah, yeah, Robot Motion, Principles of Robot Motion by a whole bunch of really good roboticists. Pithecanthropus erectus by Charles Mingus. I'm on the spot here, so I'll just go with Frankie Goes to Hollywood and hope for the best. Hmm. I don't really like fictional robots very much. Uh, I'm not one of those roboticists who loves fictional robots. I don't really have one. So, like Seth, I don't have much affinity to fictional robots either. Uh, you know, there's never a single robot that I looked at and thought, hey, that, that, that'll be inspiring. But it's worth noting, I do find uh, what they do with robots in good science fiction interesting, not because of the robot capabilities, I look at it and roll my eyes at the capabilities, but the messages they're trying to say about the either optimism or pessimism of the future. Oh, I think it was probably uh, the, the People's Republic of China just by the tomb of Chairman Mao. I liked that one quite a lot. My favorite McDonald's, without a doubt, was the one near Chairman Mao in Beijing. I'm overwhelmed by the amount of good stuff that I see. Uh, and that's not always happening. It, it might be because I'm always in meetings, and this year I'm in fewer meetings. But the, the amount of good stuff I've seen by young people is really uh, impressive, and it makes me very happy. Yeah, I have to agree. The highlight has been there's a lot more impressive uh, research being presented. And uh, the other thing that's impressive is the exhibitions. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of organizations who are here solely to recruit roboticists. So robotics is a hot uh, area now, and if you're good at robotics, uh, not to say you should quit your jobs and go into robotics, although I recommend it, uh, it's, it, you can get a good job.